Amen. Sounding a little bit dead out there, church. Don't do that to me before I've even started preaching. We're sounding a little bit dead this morning, church. Are we fired up or not? I tell you what, I'm going to pray on your behalf. I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit moves me aside so I can preach the word. But I'm going to pray that God touches your hearts. Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, God, for loving my family. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for saving the souls of the people on this roof. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation of the people on this roof that have not yet received their salvation. For the baptisms, God, that have not yet occurred. For the Bible studies that have not yet been accomplished. For the knowledge that you have not yet bestowed. I thank you, God, for the things that you are going to pour out on our lives. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the way that you are going to move me aside. The way you are going to move me aside so that you can preach to your church this morning. I don't need to pray, God, as though it if might happen, God, but that it is already yeah. happening, Father. Yeah. Because you use me on a daily basis and I'm so grateful to be used by you, Father. Yeah. Lord, I pray, God, that we can be obedient disciples. Yeah. We can be wholehearted, long life disciples. Disciples, God, who want to give absolutely everything. Because we understand that we have been given absolutely everything. Yeah. Father, please remove me from this pulpit this morning. Burn up my notes, God, if they're no good, Father. And just preach the very word that you want to put on my heart, Father, yeah. to your church this morning. Yeah. Dad, I pray that you be with me. Be with the hearts of the disciples. Open them up today. Yeah. Allow them to be fired up for Jesus, yeah. God. Allow them to remember their salvation. Yeah. Allow them to remember the hope that they have to go to heaven, Father. Yeah. To be joyful and yeah. zealous for the truth that you have given them. Yeah. Dad, please be with me. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Okay, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. The Bible says, Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. May have seen this one coming. It says in verse 27, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the rooftop. Amen. That's exactly what we're doing today. But you guys aren't fired up about that. This is, I don't know about it. I don't know. Do you need the decadent wooden walls? The red curtains of Porchester Hall? The chandeliers? Or maybe the South region has more faith than the North region. Maybe just you, you need the fire from the East and the West to get warm. Maybe that's what it is. That's not what I think. But you know, feelings aren't true, right? And even though I feel like the North region is a little bit lukewarm today, that's not necessarily true, right? But truth is, is shown by your deeds, right? So we're going to proclaim it on the rooftop today. I hope that my neighbors are listening. They see me every morning walking around Wembley crying and singing and da 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 da, -da. I hope that they're downstairs. Hey, I hope that they're down there. I hope that they're down there and they're listening to the word. In fact, I don't hope that they're just listening downstairs. But I hope that neighbors all around Wembley, all around the entire city can come and be with the kingdom of God. Yeah. Have a look at Matthew chapter 28. We're going to get into the lesson. I love that song. Trust and obey. Sounded like a lot of you guys didn't know the lyrics. So I'm going to tell you what that chorus said. It says, trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus. You know, there's different emotions that you can feel in Jesus. You can be sad in Jesus today. You can be confused in Jesus. That's not right. The Bible says that confusion is from the devil. If you're confused in your Christianity today, that's not Christ-like. And you're not trusting and obeying. If you're confused about what it means to be saved... That's because you have been distorted by false doctrine over years of your life. Salvation is clear and the Bible is very straightforward. You can be joyful in Jesus. But what does it matter if you're just always joyful and you don't do anything? Is that happiness really coming from conviction 
Or is it coming from the Word of God? But that song says to be happy in Jesus. There is no other way but to trust and obey. I'm going to ask you a question this morning, church. Are you happy in Jesus? Yes. Are you happy in your relationship with God? An absence of joy this morning evidence is a lack of trust and obedience. If you are not happy in Jesus, you are not trusting and you are not obeying. It says in Matthew chapter 28, over here in verse 18, I'm sure you guys haven't heard this one before. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority. I love Jesus Christ. No, I used to be an atheist, guys. And it was the authority of Jesus that made me go, man, I want to be a Christian. The world will tell you that Jesus is this blonde-haired, blue-eyed guy that hugs children and kisses sheep. That is not Jesus Christ. He is a man with all authority. And when I saw that in the scriptures, I was like, this guy is awesome. I want to be like Jesus. You are not an alpha male because you got big biceps, even though that's pretty cool. You're not an alpha male because you got a deep voice, even though that's pretty cool. You're an alpha male if you are like the son of God, Jesus Christ. That's what makes you an alpha male. It says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, not to the Pope. The Catholic Church teaches papal infallibility, papal supremacy, that the Pope has precedence over the scriptures. That the Pope can teach a doctrine that goes against the Bible when they'll follow the Pope instead of the Bible. The Catholic Church is not the Church of God. In the Church of England, created by King Henry VIII after he got in a discussion with the Pope, who said he couldn't divorce his wife, so started his own church called the Church of England, where he would be the supreme high priest of that church, saying that I'm the head of the church, not Jesus Christ. Like it says in Colossians chapter 1, the Church of England is not the kingdom of God. It says Jesus Christ has all authority in your life. Verse 19. Therefore, go and find disciples. No, I'm glad you guys are reading your Bible. It says you've got to make disciples. Can someone be born a Christian? Absolutely not. I was born into a Christian family. No, you weren't. You can't be born a Christian. You've got to be made. And if you're already confused, that's awesome. You're not trusting and obeying. If you're confused in Jesus within the first 10 seconds of my sermon, you've got to study the Bible with me afterwards. You can't be born a Christian. You've got to be made into a disciple. And if you didn't know, disciple and a Christian is the same thing. Acts chapter 11 says the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. That's because in that city at that time, there was so much criticism at the Christians that they were referred to as little Christs. It was a derogatory term. And so they earned that name. And Peter says in 1 Peter, you know what? If they call us Christians, bring it on. We actually kind of like that name. I want to be a little Christ. People say, Luke, what? you just sound like Michael. It's like, awesome. My parents, my family's like, yeah, you're just, you're, just, you're just a carbon copy of Michael. I was like, that's the whole point. I want to imitate. I want to be like Christ. And if Michael is the Christ-like figure in my life, I've got to be like Michael. And the brothers in this region have got to be like me if they want to imitate Christ. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. In the city of London, we have the most incredible demographic. I was brought up in Northwest. Like, you can probably see my old school from, from up on this roof. And I was the only white British kid in my whole year group, 700 children, right? But I was fired up about it. Every evening, I would go to a different friend's house and get jollof rice one day. I'd get Caribbean food the next day, get lardu and curry the next day. I'm like, I'm like, this is amazing. All nations. So when I walk into a church and it's only full of English people, that's not a church. That's not Jesus' church. If I walk into a church and it's only full of Africans, that's not Christ's church. Now, I love Africans. And I love Germans. And I love Irish people. And I love all the different kind of people. But if your church does not reflect the demographic of your city, that's sin. That is not love. And that is not the kingdom of God. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Thank you, Nicholas Giorgio. 
In the name of the Father, <laughs> someone loves the Bible. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? The Bible says you've got to baptize them. Who's them referring to? The people that you made into a disciple. Can I graduate in my teaching degree if I have not first studied for three years? No, I cannot. So how can you graduate your baptism if you've not first learned to live as a disciple and to know what it means to be a disciple? I can't study for three years, fail my exams and then graduate. So it's not about learning the knowledge of what it means to be about a disciple. It means living the life of a disciple and only then can you be baptized. Every church that baptizes infants, that's not the change of God. It can't be. What? I'm about to have a baby. Do you think I'm going to sit my, my three-year-old baby down and say, hey, bro, like, you know, you've got to go into all nations. You've got to make disciples. Da, 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 da. Children don't get it. Why are you baptizing babies? For what sin? They're pure. Ezekiel chapter 18. The sins of the father belong to the father. The sins of the son belong to the son. I'm helping you guys paint a picture. Within the first five minutes of my sermon, you see that most denominational churches, denominational churches, out in London that you can probably see from this rooftop are sending people to hell because they're not trusting and they're not obeying the scriptures in the Bible. It says in verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Everything who commanded? Jesus Christ. Nobody else's commands matter. Not Joseph Smith who created the Mormon church. Not the Pope who's in the Catholic church. Not this guy, that guy, whatever else. I'm going to obey the scriptures. Because they are life. They are breath. They are spirit. They are truth. But I've got to ask you guys a question. The title for today's sermon is, Teach Them to Obey Everything. We're sticking to discipline here. It says, obey everything. What areas of your life are off limits to discipling? For you, personally. Amen for the zealots in the room. But think, think about it. What areas will you just simply not share? I just had a brother come up to me, say, hey, yeah, bro, there's a, there's a lot going on no, at, at home, da, 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 but no, I, I don't, I don't want to say much else. And I got, I was scared. I was like, okay, are we family? You can talk. And then he was like, but we can talk about it at the end. I was like, okay, man, he's still a disciple. It's okay. <laughs> but if there are areas in your life that are off limits to me or off limits to the person in your life that mentors you, you're not obeying this scripture. You can tell me how to share my faith, but don't tell me what to wear. You can tell me how to preach, but don't tell me who I should marry. It says, teach them to obey everything. Everything in the scriptures. This is a controlling church. You can't tell me what to do. I mean, Jesus can. He's got all authority. And I've got to tell you something, guys. If you leave church upset with me today, then I have accomplished my purpose. If you leave bitter and distraught and discontented and angry, I'm totally okay with that. Because if what you hear from me today is coming from the scriptures, then you're not actually angry at me. You're angry at Jesus. If there is something that you are being called out on today, and that's what the word church means in Greek, ekklesia, those who have been called out. You're getting called out today, guys. If you're uncomfortable, you got to take it up with the big man, okay? Which is not me. I'm quite small, five foot nine. Uh, so talk to Jesus. Obey everything. Obey everything. You know, Gareth humbly came up and he said, you know, guys, I don't have an example. I shouldn't be preaching for contribution. You know why he was preaching for contribution? Because of his great example in contribution. Because of his great example in contribution. I don't know if you guys caught it. Gareth was looking for a job for two months. And the day he found one, I told him to quit it and he quit it on the spot. Some of you are clapping because you're inspired. 
Some of you are clapping because you're challenged and others of you aren't clapping because you have no faith and because you know that you wouldn't imitate that. What if I told you the same thing? Hey, your job is, is going to send you to hell. It's going to make you struggle. Yeah, but you don't know. Yeah, but you don't know. Yeah, but do you believe that I'm the man of God that is sent into your life to help you become a better Christian? I'm not Jesus. And neither can I call you to my standard because that's probably a mistake. But I've got to call you to the standard of the Bible. I love Gustav. Gustav is a special brother. We sat down in a D group. And he was fired up to tell me he'd shared his faith with 100 people. He did, he did this, he did this, cranking Bible studies. Da, da, da. I'm like, okay, bro, but you've got to throw away that t-shirt. It's terrible. <laughs> Go and just, bro, like, <sighs> you just, I, I, like, good stuff. You're just not cool. <laughs> and, you know, I, <laughs> I had to tell the bro, you know, if, if you're not that kind of brother that can go to your sister and say, sis, you got some lipstick on your teeth, then you don't really, you don't really love them. You don't really love them. But if you got to be like a good stuff and say, bro, you gotta, you just got to change the way that you dress if you want to be able to win more people. And we've got some cool guys over here. I don't remember your name, but I saw you at the gym. You're an awesome, awesome dude with the, with the hat. Um, <laughs> awesome guy, right? Hey, if Gustav is going around wearing this like skull raven thing from Lord of the Rings and like an, an owl t-shirt, he's not going to be able to win cool people like that. So I'm going to help him say, bro, if you want to be able to make disciples, you're going to allow me to teach you to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. You know, if you have a look at Romans chapter 14, you guys need to understand something. Leaders are not people who are better than you. But biblically, if someone is in a leadership position over you, all it shows is that they are more devoted to God. That sting a little bit? You guys went quiet on that one. Someone is over you in the Lord simply because of their devotion. Second Chronicles 16 verse 9 says that the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed. The reason I'm preaching about discipling today is because I am a product of it. Three and a half years ago, I was taking cocaine, ecstasy, marijuana, MDMA, ketamine, mushrooms, space cakes, pills that I didn't know the name of, different colored things, I don't know. I, I would snort cocaine out of a woman's lap, took cocaine with strippers, had sex on stage in the Netherlands. This was my life. This was, the, this was the life that the people saw. I cheated on girlfriends, traveled to different countries, would wake up with blood all over my back. I can't even remember what that was from. I would wake up upside down on the stairs with bumps on my head, bumps all over my body from falling down flights of stairs. I don't even remember that happening. I would break windows. I would break souls. I would break hearts. I was bitter, angry, disturbed, lonely. Man, I was lonely. And I was running. And I never, ever stopped. The Bible says that we should be busy, not busy bodies, right? But I was a busy body. I was constantly running around, sprinting around, and then literally, like, physically running around. I would go on for like two, three hour runs a day because I was trying to run away. Because the moment I stopped and I was left alone with my thoughts, I realized how dark my life was. I realized how sad I actually was when I took away things. I was learning like 10 instruments all at one time. I was working a job from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day, coming home, running, eating food, going to bed, nonstop, going, 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 going. Because I didn't want to be alone with my thoughts. I was dead inside. A complete atheist, didn't know Jesus. And then God saved my life. He sent a disciple into my life, taught me the Bible, showed me who God was, and I got baptized. The ability to grow doesn't come from being an awesome person, as you've just heard. I'm the worst man in Wembley. I have more sin than everybody in this room put together. And yet I'm here preaching the word of God. Because of my devotion to God. Not because of my skill, my talent, my past. My devotion to God. It says in Romans chapter 14, discipling is dependent on faith. Check this out. Verse 1. Accept him whose faith is weak. 
without passing judgment on disputable matters. It says, hey, look, when someone's just got weak faith, they can't take discipling. Your ability to be discipled is a faith issue. That's why Gareth is growing. That's why good stuff is going. That's why Trey and Abhishek and Dom, my, my interns, my guys, the Medji, that's why they're growing. The arrows in my quiver, that's, that's why my, my brothers, like Andrew, are growing. Yes. Just because they have faith to take it. Some of you, if I came to you and said, you've got to change your style, you're not very relatable, you would fall away on me. Oh, this church is so controlling. Da, da, da. You just don't have the faith. You don't have the faith to take the discipline. Point number one, you need to love discipling. Have a look at uh, 2 Corinthians. So you're going to love it, guys. I want to teach you how to receive discipling. Now, we're going to talk about discipling relationships. Let me just clarify something for those who are visiting us today. As you saw in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus commands for these kind of relationships to occur throughout your Christianity. You need to become a disciple by being made into one. And there's a lifelong relationship of someone being in your life to teach you to obey. Discipling is a command of God. If you're not in it, if there's some, not someone in your life teaching you to obey, then you're not obeying Jesus. Disobedience sends you to hell, right? So just me or is that in the scriptures? That's scripture, right? So if you're not in a relationship where someone is trying to help you to grow in Jesus, there is a massive issue there. Write that down in your notebooks and you better come and speak to me for a Bible study afterwards if that's the case. Because we've got to get people right with God here, right? So if I say D times, I'm referring to a time where you sit down with the person mentoring you to help you to grow. The church is going to get a lot of teaching today. For those of you who are guests, I pray that the Holy Spirit hits you in the heart too. But I'm going for the church. I'm going for the church. I want to teach you how to receive discipline. You know, I was, uh, I was supposed to get appointed as an evangelist, and my wife is a women's ministry leader at the World Missions Jubilee. Um, it didn't happen. And I said it didn't happen because, you know, Michelle was sick, so she couldn't be there, and, and the shepherds were, were sick, so they couldn't be there. I was like, oh, okay, so it was... You know, everyone has to be there so that we can do it. No, no. <laughs> the Lord said, no, bro. You're not an evangelist yet. No matter whether it's someone being sick, whatever, the God speaks very, very clearly that, Luke, you're not an evangelist. And the thing that was stopping me from being an evangelist, because I believe I'm one now. I believe I'm one now. But the thing that was stopping me from being an evangelist was what I'm preaching to you today. Right? The reason I wasn't discipling, the reason I wasn't pouring my heart in, into the brothers that God has in charge to me, too. And grab these two. Because if you are neglecting the job of discipling the people who are underneath you, you're probably either a coward or you're a narcissist. And I was both. <laughs> in case you guys feel bad about yourself. I was both. Coward where I, I didn't really want to confront the sin that was happening in my brothers and in my wife and in the sisters in the church and in the other leaders. Cowardice stopped me from being confrontational, but also narcissism because I want all the stats. I want, all the, I want to say, yeah, I've set up 15 Bible studies this week. I've, I've reached out to 3,000 people this week. I've made loads of follow-up calls this week. I've had da -da 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 this week. I want to be the guy with all the glory. With all the deeds, with all the attributes, everyone look at how awesome and religious I am. If I spend 10 hours a week discipling the people and helping them to be more like Jesus, then that's 10 hours out of my week where I'm not getting to go and get all the glory. Narcissist. I was so concerned with how much people saw me doing that I didn't want to pour my heart into the brothers. Because let's be honest, if I give an hour to Dom, an hour to Demeji, an hour to Trey, two hours for my wife because I love her, uh, two hours to Michael Hawks, I love him too, three hours for D Cooper. Blah, blah. I'm, that's literally like 10 hours out of, I'm not going to say it's my 40, 50 hour work week because it's not, it's 24 hours a day being a preacher. But that's, that's 10 to 15 hours out of my week where I'm not running around setting up my own studies. So I don't have any studies. 
But I tell you who his gang sucks. The guys that I'm trying to help become like Christ. But I didn't want to do that before because I didn't want people to see. Before you tap out, just because you're not mentoring someone right now doesn't mean you go, okay, this sermon isn't for me. <laughs> I'm not just talking to those who are discipling because in 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says you have the spirit of self discipline. First Peter chapter three, you got to add to your faith self-control. So if God hasn't entrusted anyone to you to mentor right now, it's because you're not able, for one. But for two, you've got to control yourself. You've got to disciple yourself. You've got to make sure your self is intact and being put to work, okay? So this sermon is for all of you. Have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter seven. You got to love discipling. It says in verse 10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. Let me just address some issues in the church. If you go to your discipler just because you want to share what's on your heart. You guys used that phrase before? Well, you're not going to look for a correction or discipling. Just like, I, I just want to share what's on my heart. You actually have a worldly sorrow. And if you get bitter at the fact that your discipler then disciples you for sharing your heart, it's because you have a worldly sorrow. Because having a godly sorrow produces a readiness to see justice done. So if you go to someone, confess your sin, and don't want them to disciple you, it's because you have a worldly sorrow. Because you're not ready to see justice done. You're not ready to receive that correction. I've heard it happen many times. And I've heard it happen more on the sister's side than the brother's side. Where you go to your discipler because you just want to get open. It's like, it's, it's, you know, it's been a hard week. It's been this. And, and, and this sin came out and I'm bitter and I'm bitter and bitter. And they go, all right, okay, amen, sis. Why don't you turn to the scripture? And you go, wait, what? Huh? I was just, I was just sharing my heart, sis. I just wanted a friend. You just wanted a friend that would go to hell with you. That's literally what it is. You just want to confess what's on your heart. Guess what your heart is deceitful. That shouldn't be on your heart. First Peter chapter four says everything that is praiseworthy, noble, admirable, lovely, that's what should be on your heart. So if you're confessing something that isn't that, you need to repent. Don't have a worldly sorrow because that will only make you die. You best believe that if you're coming to tell me something, and there's just this teeny, swincy, incy, spincy, wincy spider bit of sin. I'm going to be stepping out and scripture in you immediately. Why? Because I love you. Because I love you. But the thing that I've realized is that worldly sorrow is a result of misunderstanding the grace of God. The reason why someone wants to get open but not receive discipling is a misunderstanding of the grace of God. The reason that someone doesn't even want to get open in the first place, like our sister Daniela shared, is a misunderstanding of the grace of God. Because it requires faith to get discipled, remember? So you don't actually know the heart of God, nor the character of God, if you don't love discipling. I can ask a lot of the brothers who are married if you love getting discipled on your marriage and they say, well, absolutely. Because marriage helps you to go into a, just a different level of, oh man, I understand the heart of God. Having kids, I don't know yet, but I can imagine just hold that kid. It's like, okay, I, I get God now. I, I, get, I get this care. I get this undivided devotion to, to this jelly bean. I get it. As, as God progresses you through your life, you understand the heart of God a little bit more. But that's not to say that you can't have this as a campus or a teen or a single. 
right? You've got to understand the heart of God and to understand and love discipling. Have a look at Romans chapter 8. We can go into why you don't like it and your past and, and past hurts and abuse and everything that you've experienced that doesn't want you to be corrected. I get it. It's okay. I was abused too. It's okay. Let's talk afterwards about the, the deep bit. But I want to talk about your relationship with God, which is really the deepest bit. But in order to do that, I'm going to show you the most challenging scripture in the entire Bible. You ready? I know the North region guys. You, you, you guys are hard fighting soldiers. That's why we've renamed the region the North Legion. Because you guys are hard working. You fight. So when I say, hey, brothers, every single one of us is going to fast and pray 24 hours a day. They say, amen. amen. And they do. We got Trey up at 2 a.m. praying. We got Gustav up at 3 a.m. I can't remember the exact slots. But the, the brothers are literally praying every single hour of a day on a rotation train for the next month. Because they want to see fruit. And they're fired up to do it. If I challenge the sisters, sisters, you've got to share your faith with 20 people every single day. This is go, amen, and then they'll be fired up about it. They'll go for it, right? They're fired up for these challenges. You guys want to be smacked around the face with challenges like, come on, bro, bring it on. And you guys are fired up to do that. But this is the kind of scripture that challenges you. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. says, therefore, there is now... No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, I say it's challenging because for you guys and for me too, this kind of scripture requires way more faith for me to believe that there is no condemnation in Christ. That standing here as a disciple, even the mistakes that I made this morning, even the mistakes that I'm making as preaching are not going to be held against me. This actually requires so much more faith than, Luke, go and share your faith with 100 people. I say, hey, man, I'll go and do that. I'll go and do that. But I think the North region finds it difficult to believe that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Where we see go and make disciples and we go, Zoom. we see go and preach your word and we, Zoom. evangelism, Zoom. condemnation, what does that mean in Greek? <laughs> Maybe the word no is not there in Greek. <laughs> It is. I looked up the Greek. It means there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It means that if you are a saved disciple, you are not condemned. Neither by your righteousness nor your unrighteousness can your relationship with God change if you stay faithful. And you guys don't believe it. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're not in Christ Jesus, that's another matter. If you're not happy, it's because you're not trusting and obeying. That's another matter. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sin to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. What is this passage talking about? It says that the law found in the Old Testament of the Bible, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's the law that the Jews had to follow in order to be righteous. But it was weak because of sin. Because it only became about the law. And the religiosity of the Jews actually sent them to having unbelief and made them condemn. That's why the Gentiles were allowed to become disciples. Because of the unbelief of the Jews. So the law is imperfect. And it was never meant to be perfect. It was temporary. Just like Moses was temporary. And Jesus Christ came and died on the cross so that our righteous deeds were no longer the thing that depended for our salvation. That's why it says, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. You don't believe me. You don't understand what this means. Have a look at Job chapter 35. 
This is the, this is the part of Christianity that we forget as Christians. Because we're so absorbed with our deeds and, and what we got to do to prove ourselves. Narcissism, like me. And when I see that sin in the church, it hurts my heart because I know it's my fault. So I got to preach at my sin so that the church will change. It says in verse 5, chapter 35, look above the heavens and see. Gaze at the clouds so high above you. What do you see? Jesus. You see God when you look up there. If you sin, how does that affect him? If your sins are many, what does that do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness affects only a man like yourself. And your righteousness only the sons of men. No matter how many awesome things you do today, they're not going to make God level up. God is God, full stop. No matter how many wicked things you do, they are not going to diminish the power of God. God is God, full stop. We live in response to this truth. It's because we have faith. And we're grateful for that fact that we work hard. But we don't work hard to earn our faith or to earn our salvation. But you also got to realize that if you're not working, if you're not pushing, if you're not sharing, if you're not following up, if you're not praying, if you're not reading your Bible, it evidences your lack of faith. Because you can't truly believe that someone died for you and not be moved by that. You can't truly believe that someone's whipped and beaten and abused and not do anything about it. You can't truly believe that. So your faith is evidenced by your work, but your work doesn't prove your faith. It doesn't show that, that your faith is special. You guys still don't believe me. Mark chapter 1. This is why we got to teach this. I don't want you guys to work less. I want you to work more for the right reasons. In Mark chapter 1, it says in verse 15, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. That's my charge for the church this morning. Repent and believe the good news. That was Jesus' first message. He knew that everyone would think this is too good to be true. You've really died for everyone's sins. You've really wiped away the sins of the whole world. It's really not dependent on my works anymore. It's really not dependent on my sin anymore. I can get free grace and go to heaven. This is too good to be true. So Jesus says, all you got to do is repent and believe it. All you got to do is believe what I'm saying. All you got to do is believe that there's no condemnation in Christ and let it move you to do incredible things for God. That's all you have to do. That's all discipling is. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You just got to renew your mind. Change the way you think about your Christianity. Allow your faith to motivate you. Not to get a worldly sorrow when you're in sin. Because that doesn't affect Jesus. You just got to repent. Not to feel like you're awesome. Just because you do some bunch of righteous stuff. That doesn't give anything to God. You don't offer something into his hand and he eats it and he gets strong. Like this, that's not how it works. You need to love discipling. And if you don't, it's because you don't believe this. You don't believe that there is no condemnation in Christ. You've got to go to your disciple. You've got to bear all. And allow them to teach you the scriptures so that you can transform your life. Knowing that that transformation doesn't get you to heaven. The grace that God has given you gets you to heaven. But you transform in response to the grace that he has given you. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Have a look at Hebrews chapter 13. You know, you've got to love discipling. You also got to love your disciple. You got to love your disciple. For those of you that don't know, a discipler is the person in your life helping you to become more like Jesus. Whether that's the person and you're a non-Christian and they're studying the Bible with you, they're helping you to become more like Jesus. Whether you're already a disciple and there's someone in your life helping you to become more like Jesus, that is your disciple. If you don't have one, I'm Papa today. You can come and come under my wing. I'm going to teach you the Bible. That's okay. 
Speak to the person who invited you out and get into a Bible study. But for those who have a mentor, verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. That's scary. I'm accountable for the salvation of not just me, my wife, and my child, but of everybody in this church. I'm accountable for that. It doesn't matter how awesome I am, how well I'm doing spiritually, and how great my prayers are, and how many Bible studies I have when I get to heaven gates. And Jesus said, so what's going up with Trey? And I go, I, I don't know. Like, I've been just you now seeing if he wants to kind of do, do it on his own. And Jesus goes, that's your responsibility to help that man get to heaven. What about all those guests that came to church? That's, that's your responsibility to get them into a Bible study, to get them saved. We've got to give account for the people who are underneath them. It says, obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be of no advantage to you. Ask your discipler today. Do you like discipling me? Ask him. Don't ask him right now. But ask a good discipler. Ask the person who mentors you. Do, you. do you enjoy mentoring me? Am I a joy to mentor? Am I a, some, some of you I have not enjoyed discipling. I have since repented. You know, me and Dom, we, uh, I didn't enjoy discipling Dom at first. It was, it was challenging for me. One, because I was a coward. Two, because I was a narcissist. And three, because Dom was prideful. Um, <laughs> And, and when I tried to tell him something, he was like, yeah, but, and, and, and I was too much of a coward to, to fight him back. I didn't really believe that I was the man of God that was supposed to be in his life. But when I repented and Dom repented, it's a joy. Our discipling relationship is a joy. <laughs> but does your disciple find joy in mentoring you? Are you a joy? Or are you a burden? Does it sap their strength or does it give them faith? When I finish D time with Gareth, I am filled with faith. I'm like, this guy is awesome. He's obedient. He's humble. He's got vision. I want to help this guy. I do. Do you make it easy for your Bible talk leader to lead you? Do you? Are you a joy? To be a co-leader with? Are you? Do you make it easy for the person in your life to lead you? For the brothers in your life to lead you? Or is, is your life off limits? If they're not in your Bible talk. Oh, bro, you're not in my region. You can't tell me what to do. You are flat in sin. It needs to be a joy to disciple you. And you know... What makes a leader so encouraged? Do you know what encourages me the most about the people that I mentor? I'm not a cookie guy. If you bake me cookies, that's what you, some of you guys are thinking. I don't eat cookies. I get spots. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not good, right? Don't bake me cookies. That's not going to encourage me. Don't, sorry, I'm going to hurt some feelings here. Don't write me cards either. I like them for like 10 seconds and they end up going in the bin. I don't want to waste paper. Like, I like it. Tell me, this is fine. I'm sorry for everyone who wrote me a card. It's no longer in my house or my possession. Um, but those things don't encourage me. They do. But that's not what encourages me the most. I don't get encouraged by words of affirmation. I don't get encouraged by quality time from the people that I mentor. What I get encouraged by, and what every leader gets encouraged by, is in Job chapter 32. Take this out. Let me tell you what encourages a leader and simultaneously discourages a leader. I mean, the first couple of verses describe a preacher right here. It says in verse 18, for I'm full of words. And the spirit within me compels me. Inside, I'm like bottled up wine. Like new wineskins ready to burst. I must speak and find relief. I must open my lips 
and replied. Now, this is sometimes this is how I am after a sermon. I'm just itching to preach to you guys. I've been praying all the week. God, God put something on my heart to preach. And I'm fired up to preach. And you know what happens after I preach? I get some awesome, incredible, beautiful, humble brothers and sisters come up to me and say, Bro, I'm so inspired by your life. Bro, I'm so encouraged by your example. Bro, your worship is incredible. Bro, I love you, bro. I'm so amazed. Bro, you're only three and a half years, bro. I'm so inspired by you. That doesn't encourage me. Because it says in verse 21, I will show partiality to no one, nor will I flatter any man. For if I were skilled in flattery, my maker would soon take me away. If you were telling me you're so inspired by my life, I think you're awesome. I'm so grateful for Michael and Michelle. They gave up everything to come to London. I'm so grateful. All you guys do it in your control. All of you do it in your welcome. I'm so inspired by them. No, you are not. You are flatterer and you are deceitful because you do not imitate. If you do not imitate, you are lying. You look me dead in the face and tell me you are inspired, but you never change. You are a deceitful flatterer. You tell me you think my worship is awesome, but you don't imitate my worship. You are deceitful and you are a flatterer. Bro, I'm so impressed by your prayer life. You're a liar. I don't care if you're impressed. I want to make you like Jesus. I'm serious about this, guys. The reason I'm preaching so hard lying on discipleship is because I'm a product of it. I shouldn't be standing here. I shouldn't have a beautiful wife. I shouldn't have a beautiful home. I shouldn't have a beautiful baby. I shouldn't have a beautiful life. I should be burning in hell for the things that I've done. But I have a conviction that if I love my disciples, if I love my leaders and I'm inspired by them and I do what they do, Jesus is going to lift me up and he's going to transform my life. Where's the imitation in this church? The singing today was dreadful. It was dreadful. When have you seen me not give my heart to singing to God? I don't care if your voice isn't awesome. It doesn't matter. But some of you guys didn't even want to use your lungs today to worship God. You've been given a spine. You know, some people have scoliosis where they're constantly bent over. None of you have that issue. None of you have collapsed lungs. None of you have broken windpipes, trachea's. None of you have a malfunction in your brain where you don't understand melody. How ungrateful not to worship God. How ungrateful. You don't imitate my worship. I'm out every morning. I sing for about half an hour to an hour before I even start praying. I love to sing to God because he loves to sing to me. The Bible here says he sings over you. Even if you don't know the words to pray, you've got nothing on your heart to pray. There are 900 songs in that songbook. 900 prayers in that songbook that you can worship God with. Don't tell me that you're inspired. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 19. That's not the scripture I'm looking for. Proverbs 15. <laughs> it says in verse 5, a fool spurns his father's discipline. But whoever heeds correction shows prudence. We gotta grow this church. And it starts with our worship. Growth comes from your worship to God. And you will worship God when you understand the first point. Unmerited grace. Didn't that make you wake up in the morning? 
Does that make you grateful? Does that make you share your faith when you're like, man, I don't even deserve to be here? I'm the first person to say that because I believe it. If you say that and you're not doing anything because you don't really believe it. I love Shay. I love Shay. This man, since we have started studying the Bible, cannot stop saying, I don't deserve to be here, man. I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be here. And that's why he is unrecognizable and he wants to get baptized next week. This is a man that understands the grace of God. Don't let Satan convince you that everything that you do is, is going to send you this way and that way and the scales. No, 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 no. Jesus has already done it. He has already done it. And now that we have faith in that, now that we want to get discipled, amen? amen. Now that we want to disciple others, amen? amen? Now that we see the benefit of discipling and we want to grow and we want to make our disciples fired up, amen? amen. And we want to make it easy to be led, amen? amen? We need to know the goal of our faith, our final point, the goal of our faith. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. What is the goal of our faith? Why do we have church? Why do we have Bible talk? Why do we have D times? Why do we have mentors? Why? What is the goal of our faith? What is the goal of sharing our faith? What is the goal of, uh, the goal of church is not to bring guests, guys. You know how Mike says it, if you have a community vision, you might win your house. If you have a city vision, you might win your community. But if you have a vision for world evangelism, you will get your city, you will get your house, you will get your community, you will get the entire world, right? If we have a vision to get guests to church, you're not going to have a guest to church. If your purpose as a disciple is to set up Bible studies, you're not going to have any. If the only reason that your faith propels you, the only thing it gets you to do is to call people and say, hey, do you want to come out to my Bible talk? You're never going to get a guest out to Bible talk because that's not the point of Bible talk. It's not about having more guests. It's not about having this. It's not about having this. The goal of our faith, the goal of church, goal of Bible talk, goal of marriage What's the goal of your marriage? Be fired up about your husband? Be fired up about your wife? That's not the goal. It takes faith to be married. So what's the goal of that faith? It says in verse 8, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Some of our joy isn't glorious. We're happy, but it's not like glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The Greek says the salvation of souls. That's the goal of your faith. We have church so that we can baptize. We have Bible talks so that we can baptize. We get married so that we can baptize. We share our faith so that we can baptize. We call people so that we can baptize. It's not to get guests out. It's to save souls. Your discipling times need to stop being about your emotions. They need to be about how to save souls. Too many of us want to sit down and have a meeting with me and Frankie and tell them how upset we are at our Bible talk leader. I don't care how bitter you are. You never ask me, how do I save souls? There are people out there getting raped right this second. I heard a story about a woman who was taking her child to school. She got carjacked. The baby was thrown out of the window. So was she, but her jacket got caught in the car and she was dragged along the motorway and was found dead on the corner, ripped to shreds. And you're telling me that you're upset with the people who you lead? When you're not sharing your faith? When there is a child in that flat right now getting molested and you don't want to call anyone and get them to church? When you're not focused on baptisms? When there are people getting abused? 
when there are countless homeless people around London and you're saved. You're sitting on a rooftop in Wembley, overseeing the whole Wembley Stadium and you don't want to save anybody. You don't want to baptize anybody. You just want to tell me how upset you are. Shame on you. We're here to baptize. Get over it. If you are upset with the person that you lead with, apologize and move on. How can we save people? How can we do it? I want to have more questions about how can we save people, Luke? Bro, how can I be better at sharing my faith? How can I be better at praying, bro? How do you get these insights from the Bible, bro? How, how, do I, how do I do this? I'm not Jesus, guys. But I'm supposed to make you like him. But I don't get these questions. People don't ask me, how do I save people? They ask me, when can I leave? It's, it's time we change our mind. And understand that the purpose of our faith is to save people. The purpose of discipling relationships is to save people. The reason I've invited you to this roof this morning is so that we can save people. That's Jesus' heart. That's my heart. That's Michael and Michelle's heart. That's my wife's heart. Let it be our heart. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. But when salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's not possible. So don't lose your saltiness as disciples. Don't forget why we're in this in the first place. You can change the world. Every single one of you has the power and the ability to change the world. Because Jesus has the power and the ability and all authority to change the world. You can do it, guys. You can do it. It's time we have fruit in the North region. It's time we're focused on saving souls. It's time we speak and have real discipling times, not therapy sessions. It's time we surface our heart and surface our sin so that we can change the world. I believe in you guys so much. Otherwise, I wouldn't be breaking my voice up here to do it. I wouldn't be praying for you every single day if I didn't believe in you. I wouldn't be begging God for you every day if I didn't believe in you. I love you guys so much. We need to do this. To God be all the glory. Yeah.